Welcome to Spiritual Studies Session 54. This is on the Sian mythology. The Dacian people, for those that are unacquainted, were the pre-Transylvanians, so to speak. The paganism and subsequent monotheism, in air quotes, that was present in the area of Transylvania prior to Romanization. This culture, these people, are also included in what would be considered Thracian. They are a subgroup of the Thracian people. <clears throat> this mythology of the Dacian people has been overshadowed by the predominance of Greek and Roman mythology. And as is the case in history, the winners get the narrative, right? Um, no matter how painful that predicament is. And in this case, it was the Romans that took over these people. However, their culture still lives on in Romania, and its influence throughout Europe and the amount that was taken by the Greeks or by the Romans from the Dacian people culturally is something that we'll be going through today. So in what we can know of these people is always going to point to different historical accounts. Pliny the Elder... Herodotus as a, as a big contribution. And so we're always getting impartial and we're getting accounts from other cultures. So we do have a certain grain of salt to entertain here. When someone immediately thinks of Romanian culture, the stereotype always goes to the supernatural, the vampire, the werewolf, Dracula's castle, yada yada. And we're, we're going to dismantle this a bit, but I want to say right now before I forget, the modern day uh, superstition or cultural idiosyncrasy of the zombie or the one who feeds off blood is known as the stigoi, which has its own associations that could lead to the originating conception of the vampire and the originating conception of the zombie one and the same. Stigoi, S-T-I-G-O-I. When we dive into these different mythologies, we're going to see a number of mutualities between other cultures. These people, however, were inhabiting this area from 5,600 B.C. to 3,500 B.C. upon their arrival. You know, this is a big swath of time, but... Regardless, they would have been inhabiting this area uh, before the times of ancient Egypt, before Sumeria. So this is seemingly the original Proto-Indo-European um, movement. And the Decian people, just to give a, a better geographic, the a strong association is west of the Black Sea in the Carpathian Mountains in the areas of Romania, Moldova, Bulgaria, Hungary, Ukraine. And the language would have been a subgroup of Thracian, so a distinct culture within the greater Thracian uh, group. And there would have also been some swaying influences with the Celts and with the Scythians. Now, when it comes to the name Dacian, this is a Greek word for these people. And then there is the Roman word, getai or gete. <clears throat> Preface, as I always do, pronunciations are hard when you're a reader. 
Uh, I've tried to do my research to hear how different people are pronouncing these terms, though. So, I'm going to use the term Dacian, being that I'm giving some credo to the fact that it's an older reference. But when you are researching this subject, you might just as easily run into Gete or uh, Geta, uh, G-E-T-A-E. So there's some confusion about which one to be used at different points of history. And, and a lot of the time, they would use simply both. And I've seen in certain sources, it looks like they're distinguishing different groups by these names. Uh, this is confused. But this Dacian term has been argued etymologically to mean wolf from the Phrygian language deus, um, meaning wolf, or from the older root deo, uh, D-H-A-O, meaning to strangle, to gather. Uh, this strangling reference is, is to a wolf because that is the means that they uh, kill their prey. And so these people would be kind of a wolf people, and we're going to dissect that. And from the earlier groups uh, of which they would have come from, the, the Lycaeans, the, the Lucanians, you know, this all has a flavor of wolf veneration, the Dahai. And not to mention, too, the sigil of these people, the flag, the symbol, would have been a draco, which is um, a wolf head on a serpent or a snake's body. And there's some good esotericism to go into there. And, of course, this is an argument. There are many... I haven't seen many other examples, but I've seen some interesting arguments against this meaning wolf, but... If you go to modern-day Romania, you'll see that a good portion of establishments are named after a wolf or wolves. Uh, and we'll get into that in a bit. But I, I want to say, when these cultures, the Greeks, the Romans, describe these Dacian people, they are generally thrown into the barbarian bag. The barbarians being all manner of people to the north of them, essentially. And as opposed to the Greeks, you know, thinking of themselves as tall and uh, having lighter skin and having these blue eyes, they, they look at the, the Thracians and they think that they have this uh, straight hair and they are ruddy and tawny and they have these big trimmed beards and they come with tattoos and all manner of body paint. And it's something to say that within the Dacian culture that the tattooing was a religious was of religious significance was a part of some sort of ceremonial initiation or worship so when it comes to all these establishments being named wolf in some form the trope i want to touch on straight away goes back to the chimera and shape-shifting talk where it's all about the ancient shamanism of skinwalking or of imbibing the animal spirit, which is um, taking on the attributes through channeling of the most predominant and feared creature in the area, which is a trope all across the world. In South America, it was the jaguar. In Africa, it was the hyena in certain places. And here across Europe, it's the wolf. And so the people in their shamanistic practices would embody the wolf. And the wolf became their cultural totem. And this isn't far off from the Germanic people either, known for their berserker-like rage in, in battle. Um, <clears throat> it's also going to play into... Uh, the Dacians' cultural motifs, that they fight in a pack, that they fight for each other, that they fight for the group. So, and, and in addition, when they would go into battle, they would howl to further embody that voraciousness of the, of the wolf. So, right away you can start to see how history has come to misunderstand 
the werewolf. And it's as simple as this. The old practice, and I've touched on this before, the old practice of channeling uh, and, and cultural emulation of a, of a feared animal, apex predator. And, and that plus a man, not this literal transformation of such, but this um, maybe, maybe allegory. And through miscommunication, miscommunication, now we have this rampant kind of uh, conception of a supernatural superstition. Within the Dacian uh, lore, we do have the legend of the Great White Wolf. I'm going to touch on this lightly, because I would encourage anybody to look into this, the actual verbiage of this legend, but... In lost times, there was a high priest called Zemoxis, and we're going to mention him plenty in the future. And he was roaming through, and he was trying to find a way to tend to the people that were in need at this lost time. And so he goes far beyond their territory, and he's among the beasts, and among the wolves he was considered a leader. So this symbiotic relationship between the wolves and the Dacians is a, is a, big, is a big no. And after a while, Zalmoxis uh, summons a deity, a large and mighty white wolf, to um, protect the Dacian people from what is coming. So his purpose was to gather all the wolves in order to protect Dacia. And so whenever Dacia was in danger, the wolves would come into their aid, followed by their leader, the Great White Wolf. So it's kind of a shame to see how they have painted the werewolf motif out of all this, to make it this negative character of brutal, like, ripping through towns, of, of, like, merciless killing. Because as you can see in this spark notes of the great white wolf legend, it's very much um, a positive force. So... This wolf conception also is not uncharacteristic of Europe during this time. If you go and look up um, in Norse mythology, as it spreads into Germanic as well, the Angerboda, or the Angerboda, A-N-G-E-R-B-O-D-A, the Witch of the Iron Wood, the mother of wolves, the mother of the apocalypse, the hag of the east winds, this reverential goddess that is the mother of wolves. Another animal in this way that was always sacred and across the world as we've covered is that of the serpent and its, and its variant of the dragon. So it's not surprising that we see that in their Draco sigil. Another thing that isn't necessarily uncommon that we find with the Dacian people is this reverence of the holy fire. And this still continues on in the neo-pagan Romanian communities. This holy fire aspect, meaning, um, well, let's not get into that. The Thracians had the divination of flames, and they had the rever the reverence of the fireplace and its part as the guardian of the house. And we see this in the goddess Vesta, which I think is Roman, and you see this in Hestia, which is Greek. So then comes the question, did the Greeks have this originally? Or is this something that they're taking from the Thracians? Because as we'll see throughout this talk, they're taking plenty from the Thracians. But the Thracians had these houses built in a rectangular form with stones or wooden walls. And they would have these two angled roofs. 
and people have been digging these up and that that's where we're getting how long that's how people are knowing how long these people have been in this area no less than 7000 years old and these walls were built around the fire the hearth as it's been known and this would have been the reverential space the sacred space within the sacred fire and that the fire would have constantly been tended to and kept. And this is uh, religiously significant across shamanism, and well within uh, the kind of lesser-mentioned lore of different paganisms. The sacred fire, which we've seen the usage of plenty. Uh, you know, Christianity's appropriation of it would have been the use of fire in all of the angelic appearances uh, throughout the Bible. And the appearances of God has always come with flames. Yeah, there's a lot to dissect there. A little digression I want to touch on. I want to get back on that vampires thing. So while we see the vampires are mentioned in some nearness form in ancient Sumeria, Assyria, and in Jewish mythologies as these nocturnal, nocturnal demonic... Um, entities that would feed on blood and whether that happened there first and it came into Europe doesn't really matter because as we're seeing in Europe the Dacians had the same concept of this vampire now here's the thing the Dacians believe in or believed I don't know in immortality and joining the realm of Zamaxos and to those that didn't though would hang around as um, wicked spirits that would try to cling on to life, that would uh, feed on the blood of living people in order to sustain their haunted existence. And so this is a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing, per se, although the lines of that are pretty gray, if I, if I may say. Uh... So the Stygio, the zombie, the, the vampire, all these things as they've been, you know, turned into these cultural motifs have a root in, in, a, in a kind of afterlife conception, at least if we're looking plainly at the Dacians. The, the non-worthy deceased. And key term, deceased. Gone. In, in some form. So, there is a lot of hedging to be had with a lot of what I'm mentioning. Normally, if I get to go through a subject like this, I'm going to lay out the, the, the afterlife, I'm going to lay out the cosmogony, I'm going to lay out a variety of different deities, and with the Dacians, and by virtue of how history has panned out, um, there's only so much I can say, and there's only so much I could dig into. But I want to name a few of the gods and goddesses as has been known. And one I want to point out straight away is Dionysus. And you might be thinking, hey, that's Greek. And this is where I say, hey, you know, check yourself. Because <laughs> we have reason to believe that Dionysus was Thracian and then came into the Greek. Then we have Zalmoxus, of which I've already mentioned, and we'll talk plenty about him later, but became the supreme deity. And then there's Gelbezus, um, which is the god of thunder, lightning, rain, and was the supreme deity before Zalmoxus. Then there's Bendis, Codus, and Z uh, Derzelis, of which we'll all focus a little bit less on, and, and the two additional is Pleistoros and Zabazeos. And all of these have interesting intertwinings with different surrounding mythologies, but let's, let's, let's focus instead. Dionysus, the grapevine deity, the patron of wine, but more specifically, the dizzying liquor. This cult Dionysus, of which I've mentioned before in the uh, course, 
is in hearkening back to ceremonies practiced by the Thracians. And so the mysteries of that tradition has to do with the fact of the mystery of the Thracian people and the Dacian people. The fact that it's mysterious is because it got plummeted over. And for what the Greeks were involved in, they did not uh, retain. And other, you know, uh, the secret society, the secret initiations of Zalmoxis know nothing about, with exception to maybe there's things known within Romania and in these small communities. Now, how we know that Dionysus is Thracian is that before Dionysus came, well, I should say, Dionysus was told by his grandmother to go back to Thrace and to participate in the Phrygian Mysteries. So why would, you know, it seems like the Greeks, by, by making this line, wanted to honor where it was coming from instead of seeming to make it all their own and take all the credit for it. But this initiation, you know, this chewing of the ivy and the grapevine and the procuring of these, you know, was Dionysus's favorite plants, no accident, chewed by his hot, in, in quotes, worshippers in combination with drinking large wines of wine, uh, large amounts of wine quantities. And so not only drunkenness, but potential mania and madness, and as has been speculated, the crossing of this with Urgot of Rye, of Anamita Mascara, what have you, as, as a full-on psychedelic uh, experience. And this was the most popular celebration of the Thracian people. And there's been arguments as to how often it's happened. Some would argue that it would happen quite regularly, and then others would argue that it would happen every three years. And all would go into the account, and we would only know that if we truly knew what exactly these ceremonies looked like, and what were the arcane, esoteric reasons behind each of the actions undertaken. So there's Dionysus out of the way for a bit. Now, Gebel Gebelizes, and I know I'm saying this one wrong, Thunder God, the predominant deity prior to Zalmaxus. God of thunder, lightning, having a spear, battling a snake. <laughs> this does not sound all too unfamiliar. The Canaanites had this. Yeah, anyway. Large, bushy beard, resembling, and he also had red hair, of course, resembling the Germanic Thor. So then comes the question, which one comes first? He was known as also Durzus or Durzelus, uh, the Thracian knight used in Macedonian mythology as well. The name Zeus is related in some form, because if you look at uh, the god of the Saxons, Sexnot, you see that it is also known as Tyr, which is a Nordic deity, or Tu, or Tewos, which is a rune which is related to Zeus, or Zeus, or Zeus. So, through the linguistic jamble and miscommunication of different languages throughout, you see that all these different European mythologies have the same deity, or the same root, and are naming it differently, uh, and ascribing different attributes to it accordingly. But the Thracian knight here and Thor are really not too far off from each other when it comes to details. And likewise, you see that the Armenian hedonists uh, used this particular deity in Vahag, or Vahang, the god of war and the god of the sun, known as the snake slayer. We're not getting into the snake stuff today, but 
Another reference is how this was appropriated in the myth or the lore of St. George slaying the dragon. This is a direct appropriation from Dursus, Gabelzis, Thunder, Celestial God. Uh, personified by the eagle. And if you find this, if you trace it all the way back to shamanism and, uh, like, contrast it with Native American conceptions, Father Sky. Father Sky is the eagle, the eagle that soars above. And the snake is that of the earth, that of which his belly is always on the earth, the archetypal opposites. Oh, Gebelzis, or Gebelzis, um, was known by the uh, Thracians and by the Dacians uh, as a clear sky, although capable of thunder, was known as a clear sky. And anything that would disturb this clear sky had to be combatant. So, the Dacians had a practice, as is told by Herodotus, so, you know, whether we believe it or not, where they would shoot arrows in the sky to drive away the clouds to help the Sky Father, to pay homage to the Sky Father. And on the other side, you know, so here's Father Sky, and so the, the kind of alter ego or the uh, other end of things is Bendis and is also known as Kotis, of which the name I also mentioned, the Great Mother Goddess, deity of the moon, uh, known for her uh, help with the hunt in the, in the menstrual cycle. So right away we can take this and we can contrast it with the Greek Artemis, goddess of the hunt, associated with the moon, menstrual cycles, she is depicted standing between a deer and a snake, which is a reoccurring motif of the deity of balance in the cycle of nature. So, you know, that deer and snake thing, the deer being this kind of majestic innocence, and then the snake being this visceral, earthly uh, sharpshooter, you know. So, this mother goddess, Bendis, was revered equally, or not necessarily equally, but by both men and women. This was not exclusive, you see. So, the cultural roles of men and women were seemingly very defined, but their worship was across the board. A woman or a man would just as much honor Bendis as they would... Uh, Father Sky. And, I mean, if you really think about it, there are two sides of the same coin. And if you really think about it, would you not honor both your mother and your father? So there was a cult of Benzis. They found these different clay medallions in their architecture of this ancient city. So there was another cult. There was another secret initiation of Bendis that has been lost to time. And you see that this inspiration of Bendis moving through into the name Diana, or uh, Diana in the Roman conception, uh, the word Zana, Zasania, Sancta Diana, that maybe, just maybe, the cult of Diana or the initiations of Diana are coming from Bendis. So again, the question is, Thracians have it first. And this other one to mention quickly. Zabazios, the king, the shaman, the horseman, related to Wotan because he too had an eight-legged horse, which in the Norse tradition is Sleipnir, and is linked to the underworld in the realm of death. So, here we have a, a direct, not just, I mean, I don't know if he's the head honcho, really. We have another reference to not, we had Thor, and we also have Woden, Odin. 
And I suppose you could say that Zabasios, this, this shaman, is more related to what will come in Zelmoxus. So let's get to Zelmoxus, you know. We've, we've seen some higher deities, you know, here. Or maybe some of the most coined deities. Zelmoxus, though, was a man. The story is that he was a man. A priesthood, you know, like one of the priesthood, one of the high magicians. And so there's debate on whether he was a historical figure or something that serves a purely religious function. Now let's check ourselves here. Would we not say the same of Jesus? Would we not say the same of Hermes Trismegistus? The question always being, did they actually exist? Are these actual people? Because when we looked at the Celts, we started to notice that there were plenty of deities that really weren't far from humans. So in which case, a human does a very heroic thing that makes a great difference for a people. And in time, they get mythologized. And then they, they throw on all these additional attributes that mythologize them. And so, could that be the case of, you know, Jesus, Salmoxus, Hermes, Trismegistus. It's all in that same ambiguity. Anyhow, this uh, religious figure became a predominant force throughout Thrace, and especially the Dacians. And according to Herodotus, the man, Salmoxus, was a slave to Pythagoras. So look at how, like, <laughs> this is strange stuff, right? Look how interrelated this is. You know, because they're neighbors, right? And, you know, the, the Greeks, the Romans, were always taking slaves from the north. And so, Zalmoxus being either a slave or a confidant or a student of Pythagoras would have learned of the, all the things that were going on in the Pythagorean initiations, which, as we've gone through, uh, as we've noted throughout the course, involved mathematics, astronomy, numerology, um, vegetarianism, aestheticism, uh, all manner of mysticism, things well beyond what we know of Pythagorean as well. So, regardless, he was taught and left that world by the story. And similarly, came with the concept of immortality um, and came back to the people of Dacia and taught them of this immortality, taught them of the afterlife, of enjoying the everlasting pleasures, afterlife. Zalmoxus, after giving these teachings, went into an underground chamber or a cave of sorts and disappeared for three years. And the people thought he was dead. They thought he was gone. But on the fourth year, he emerged, showing that death was not irreversible. Now, I just want to point out there, with the analogy of Jesus here, you know, because this did happen first. Historically, Zelmoxus happened first. You know, going down for three days, rising on the fourth, not just as an analogy to what Easter represents, but also to an analogy of what the summer solstice or the, the winter solstice represents, where the sun dies for three days and rises on the fourth. I'm not getting into that. I've gone I've gone plenty into that into the course. So whether we believe that Zalmoxus was a slave or a student, it doesn't really matter. There's also uh, an account of Strabo uh, saying that Zalmoxus studied not just with Pythagoras, but also from the Egyptians. So maybe Zalmoxus wasn't too far away from the story of Pythagoras. And by that I mean Pythagoras went all around the ancient world and learned from a great variety of people and brought that wisdom back with him to his culture. And here we can see Zalmoxus, a prophet, a priest. And this, eventually, this teaching of immortality, uh, you know, was not uncommon because you see 
Plato speaking of the same sort of philosophies. Um, and just to further the point uh, in more, what makes it more distinctly Romanian is, or Dacian, I should say, is that Zalmoxus in these teachings also teached the uh, wisdom of charms, the wisdom of, of plant medicines, of hallucinogens, of different medicinal properties. And the Greeks took this on hand and fist. Uh, when it came to their wisdom of magical herbs, when it came to their wisdom of how to treat things via herbs, they took this wisdom from the Thracians. The Thracians had it. And by extension, the Dacians. So whether Zalmaxus was a man, whether he was a, a story, uh, or a man-god, you know, as we've seen, the Greeks did that plenty, it eventually became... Zalmoxus became the main god, the, the, the end-all, be-all, the monolithic monotheist. Um, and so here comes the debate. With these other gods in tow, did the Dacians become monotheists? And that's the interesting note, is because we've seen throughout the pagan past that uh, there's a word for this that I forget, but there's often times where it's happened where a pantheon dissolves and it becomes completely centered around one. We saw this in some form with Marduk in the, in the Babylonian traditions. You could argue this happened with the Canaanites, uh, with, with Yahweh, being that Yahweh was another part of the pantheon up until the uh, political uprising of the Old Testament. Uh, the attempt of Atonism in, in Egypt. There's more examples of this, you know. There was This was also done in Crete with Zeus. So, whether we say this is monotheistic or not is just a, a, a distinction of terms. Um, and also of time period. But regardless, Almoxus completely reformed what was previously worshipped and reformed the religious conceptions of the Dacian people. And this was taken by later historians to be a propitio evangelica, meaning that this was a predecessing, a marker of what was to come, the cult of Zalmoxus, because we all know what it was to come. Jesus, right? And Jesus really brought that monotheism, and that wiped out all the rest, you see. So... Zalmoxus was this kind of foreshadowing, or was a, perhaps a direct inspiration. So let's um, start jumping around some random notes, and I know this is a rather jumbled talk, but there were, were stories of the tattooing of the Thracians being um, done to pay solidarity to Zalmoxus and the pain inflicted upon him when he was a slave. So it was a solidarity. I will feel the pain of Zalmoxus, as he did, to honor Zalmoxus by getting the tattoos. Is this not giving you some Jesus vibes here, you know? People wanting, like, stigmata and all this stuff. Oh. And so, you know... There, there are these cross-references between slavery and tattooing, that tattooing is a homage or, or a solidarity or an empathy towards the pain of slaves. And so that's an interesting contrast to how people treat tattoos nowadays. But, you know, all tattoos in the ancient world had religious or spiritual significance, you know, prior to what we've become nowadays. But that's a, that's a whole different session. We do have a historical account that uh, refers to the Thracian women tattooing themselves for the sufferings inflicted upon Orpheus. Now that's an interesting nod because this could have been a swap of Zalmoxus and Orpheus or it is to say that Orpheus is also in the mix of the Dacian religious reverence that the Orphic mysteries would have also been undertaken by the Thracians, or 
is this Greek or is this Thracian? So again, we have a bit of confusion. Is this a simple misinterpretation or is this hinting at something much larger? And, you know, ay ay ay. Now, I want to mention before I move on to this aspect of Zamoxos moving into the underground chamber, moving into the cave and re-emerging. Plato's clay cave analogies going on here. Uh, different Pythagorean wisdom in, in regards to oculation and in regards to catabasis or epiphany, in regards to reincarnation, a metempsychosis, uh, you know, not to mention, too, all of the practices of uh, astronomical uh, understanding, you know, of when to, when he would emerge, when the stars were correct, when he would go down, when the stars would say so what the plant medicines would say. <laughs> but regardless, within the Dacian community, you have the practice of aestheticism, living in minimalism, and abstaining from meat. And this is seemingly a holdover from Pythagoreanism and what came with Zalmoxos, because if you look over to a Jewish historian, Flavius, he notes that the Dacian people live a life like the Essenes. Okay. So the people, the Dacian people, were known for their complete lack of fear toward death. And this isn't altogether uncommon because the Celts were also this way. And it's this uh, strong, 100% unquestioning belief in the spiritual tradition. And in this way, there's a 100% non-questionable belief in reincarnation, in psychosis, in the belief of the soul surviving after death and going to a happier place. So in this way, one would almost welcome the occasion of death because life is a worse place than the next. And so when it comes to battle or when it comes to dying for something, you would not hold yourself back. And to those that do have those fear, that fear, these other cultures, you would appear as a berserker, as a wolf man. So, you know, you live a good life and you honor justice on this earth and you work hard to reach that afterlife of the realm of Zamoxis. And the Pythagoreans are not super far away from this in a different kind of way. And although this, this concept of death is not foreign to the Greeks, especially with the Orphic, uh, the Orphic rites, however, there are some unsettling terms in this way because the uh, Dacians would do human sacrifice. They would do this every four years. They would send a messenger to Zelmoxus. They would pick somebody within their ranks to sacrifice. And this was considered a, a great honor. So, assumably, one would be very willing to put their life down for this, as because of the cultural mechanisms I was mentioning before. So the sacrifice looked like this. They would lift him or her up and they would throw them in the air onto three spears. <laughs> and it was viewed as a great shame if they died instantly. The ideal was that they would die somewhat slowly so that the people could talk to the one, the messenger of the Zalmoxos, the one who was dying, and tell him what to tell Zalmoxus or what to pray for or what the people need as a direct conduit, a messenger to the realm of beyond. And if this person did not die, they were considered unworthy of this position of messenger. And so they would be shamed and they would live in, in shame in some way because the people would then count that as a way of knowing that this person has evil in their heart, that they have sin. 
And so if they couldn't do it, they would sacrifice somebody else. Somebody else would be chosen. And so the Greeks couldn't really get down with this. But, but if they followed their ideals to their end, if they really believed in this immortality, then why wouldn't they partake in sacrifice? You see? So it's kind of like, you know, putting your money where your mouth is in a way, you know. And I'm not endorsing sacrifice, but it is a subject that I haven't got to really touch on too much in this course because there are many ways religiously and spiritually that it was uh, validated that we don't really care to go over in the modern day. We, we tend to just wave it off as this like insane savagery. Anyhow, as that note that I noticed, uh, as I noted before about the Greeks taking on the plant medicine, the uh, herbal wisdoms of the Thracians, if you look at the Romans, or, or uh, gosh, I should say, modern Romanian incantations in their own folklore, their own folk dances, their own folk medicines. This is coming from the wellspring of the knowledge held by the Dacians. And where they got it from, who knows, right? I mean, we could speculate about that. But the Materia Medica, written by the, um, the Greeks, uh, Dioscarides, included over 40 different medicinal plants straight from Thrace. Another cultural idiosyncrasy of the Thracian and by extension the Dacians is this polyamorous way of life, describing them as having many wives or keeping several wives. And it was said that if the man died, the head of the household, one of these women, the most beloved as they were coined, would be strangled by the closest relative of that man, a brother or father, what have you, and would be buried along with him. And they would volunteer for this because all the ones that weren't killed would be ashamed that they were not the chosen one to lay with the beloved. So a lot of this might seem disturbing, and I just want to point out that our approach to death has been inherited by the Greek tradition. Our cultural modality has been inherited. Our own taboos and our own ways of thinking have been inherited by a different tradition. So... When we think of this as disturbing, I don't want to say this is right, but what I'm saying is the reason it's disturbing is because of your cultural modalities. And your cultural modalities would be disturbing to these people, you see. So death is a very shifty topic when it comes to how to rationalize it. Ugh. Now... Another thing that really goes unmentioned is that in the capital of Decia, you have a sphinx that was called the Night Master. And this Night Master gets reference in the Orphic Mysteries, that they would pr uh, practice these mysteries in the nighttime amidst the Night Master. So these different um, initiation, these different esotericisms would have been around this sphinx, which you can find in the ancient uh, capital of Decia. And I'm going to try to say this, so I'm going to spell it first. S-A-R-M-I-Z-E-G-E-T-U-S-A. Zarmitz gets to a, gets to a. Zarmit gets to a regia. In the Carpathian Mountains, you can still find these ruins. I think it's a UNESCO site. 
very mysterious place. And it was the capital of Decia. And two millennium ago, this was the last stand against the Roman conquest, of which they officially became overrun in the second century AD. And the story of the last king of Dacia is a is a fascinating one. Uh, and he's been a very honored figure in history, so look into that if that's intriguing. They had uh, all manner of um, water supplies, irrigation, ceramics, iron crafting. Uh, they, they, they had a calendar that's been discovered. There was a, a regular common person, a civilian calendar, but then there was another calendar Stonehenge style. And here's something, I don't want to go into this to the point of like, uh, um, just painful minutia, but try to hear me out. You've got 60 weeks in the year, six days each, and there's a 68-day correction period. There are 68 pillars, um, and there is a 13-year cycle, and this cycle is following the moon. And once you, know, once you start to get into how to understand the specific uh, timekeeping system, the specific clock, you'll see that it's actually very complex and has a lot of uh, cunning and mathematics behind it. Um, that it was so precise that if you ran the clock for 2,275 years, you would only be 38.88 seconds off of what we uh, ascribe to be the most accurate of uh, function. So, although this is the ancient times, you see here at this ancient site of the Dacians that their calendar is way beyond what you would expect of them. And so, the advancement of the people is something that should be noted because it has been overlaid, destroyed by time, you see. And something I want to point out, too, that I've wanted to bring out throughout the course, but I've never really had the chance. It's not super related, but... When you see these ancient myths of the universe or the world living on the back of a turtle, what that's all about is if you look at these big tortoises and you look at their shell, you look on the inside, the inside circle of the shell is 13 different sections. And if you look on the outside of the shell, you have 28 different sections. And by the ancient calendar, as it was across the world, you had 13 months in the year associated with the 13 moons. And the 28 years is the 28 full, is the full cycle of the moon's orbit patterns where it returns to the same exact depiction it was before. So, this is time, the 13 and the 28. This is the universe on the back of the turtle. Now, in the modern day, to step out of that, there is a neo-Zalmoxanism. That it, and, and this is a neo-paganism that is taking from Romanian folklore and taking from Thracian and from Dacian uh, spirituality, but it's more of an amalgamation. It, it can't be thought of a pure uh, renaissance of Dacian spirituality because it includes a lot beyond that. And an argument of the neo-pagans is that this movement is not being invented, it's being unraveled by the many discoveries and the many... Um, reminiscences of what was lost in the past. These uh, neo-pagans, though, have appropriated Christianity in a certain way as well. I mean, by sheer influence in the Zalmoxis cross, because Zalmoxis never had an association with the cross. However, we have seen the rampant analogies between Zalmoxis and Jesus. And, but uh, interestingly enough, too, within the Zalmoxis cross is the flower of life, which is a 
Hindu um, symbol, which has been grossly misrepresented across history, but I'm not even going there. And, you know, so what is this exactly? You can't call this a pure, a pure nod back. It looks like it's appropriating in different ways, which is kind of the nature of spirituality, because as I was saying throughout all this, what, what this religious tradition, this god, is this purely a Dacian god? Well, no, you also see this in Greece, you also see this in Norse, you also see this across the world, and yada, yada, yada. Okay, so what, where does the line get drawn, right? Like, at what point are you drawing the line between the Thracians and the Greeks, or the Thracians and the Orphics, or the, or the Germanic tribes and the Dacians, you know? There's a lot of uh, undulation between these definitions, and so you're seeing this now with these new pagan, well, I don't know if I want to call it new, with these neo-pagan movements. This eclectic grab-bagging that is trying to reinvent in a new way. And, you know, taking back this polygamy, taking back this polyamory, living cultural modalities that have been long suppressed. This is a natural consequence. I mean... People were living a certain way, they were repressed, you know, violently taken over, there will be an innate willingness to return to that which was. Oh. So, this willingness to return to this undogmatic, free-spirited, openness is seen throughout the world but is very poignant here and in, in why these neo-pagan movements are arising uh, however there is a concern in the very creation of a neo zalmoxian bible because a bible is not something a book is not something that the ancients do a paganism is not a book thing, it's a living tradition. Although I can see how in playing into the modern day, a book would really kind of codify, uh, give credo, um, credibility to the movement um, so that it might just be something that's being done for posterity while the tradition is still being allowed its free-flowingness. But anyhow, in summation, here is a ancient, almost forgotten religious tradition beyond Romania that deserves some attention. And I hope in years to come, more is unraveled at this ancient capital, more is nodded back to when it comes to different cultural modalities, and especially if we can continue to unravel what really went into these ancient rites, these ancient initiations. Um, and, you know, I'm super fascinated by the coin superstitious side of the Romanian folklore. I think I might, I might go into that in the future. But, you know, before I could even do that, it's very worth the mention of this Dacian origination in these Romanian uh, idiosyncrasies. They are perhaps the one of the best roots that we can get when it comes to understanding belief as it sprawled throughout Europe and, uh, and what beliefs were like prior to humanity reaching Europe in the way that it did. But with that, I will close.